The All Black Podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black become the best run teams in sport. To listen to this episode and all the All Black Podcasts, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Kira Fano, welcome to the All Black Podcast, powered by SAP. About to hit the semi-final stage of the Rugby World Cup in France, so it seems a good time to dig a little bit deeper into that tournament in that country, the fans, the stadiums, the culture, and of course, one of the All Black's great rivals, the French rugby team. To help us get a feel for the tournament abroad is former Counties, Blues, Crusaders, and 21 Test French international, Tony Marsh. Welcome to the pod, mate. And actually, just back from uh, France, eh? How was the trip? And it was it was pretty epic. Too good. So, Too good. <laughs> yeah, I'm st- st- need a holiday from the holiday. Yeah. I think, uh, mate, I had five weeks up there and uh, a real mix of stuff. So holiday, catching up with friends, a bit of rugby. So, but real good, good energy up there. Really good vibe and and good to be back up there. I think um, being down in the the corner of the world, so to speak, down here and in NZ, we forget that there's a big bad world out there. So. Yeah. To be honest, probably the time of my life. Yeah, how good, mate. Well, it's been a while since you've been back. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but you've been, spent so much time there. And they just know, they just, meals are events, aren't they? And, and getting to get is an event. It's just, it's not just quickly catching up for a coffee and a bit of lunch or something along those lines. It's, it's just, you've got to set aside a decent bit of time in the calendar. And it's just around being around people, enjoying food, enjoying wine. Like it's just, it's a style of living, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Yeah, and you nailed it. It's all about that, the food, the wine, your friends, family, and just hanging out and having a good time. So got a lot of that in it, a lot of red wine, a lot of good food, um, a lot of good quality time with some friends I haven't seen for a very long time. So, yeah, just uh, you sort of forget about um, some of the simple things in life. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, Look, we're recording this on Thursday before the quarterfinals. So this is going to come out next week before the semifinals. But I want to throw in the deep end straight off the bat because this obviously there's a lot. We're chatting a lot around the All Blacks uh, versus Ireland, which is um, at the start of France. There's some amazing games of footy this weekend, and probably, I mean, in that part of the world, the most anticipated game is France versus South Africa. Like that, that is a game. And and um, what do you reckon, mate? Because you've won your, you know intimately connected to French rugby but also you've just been over there and and what's the vibe is is there real confidence that they can get the job done because we talked a little bit before we jumped on the pod is um, all this noise around DuPont and whether you will play or not and, and they lost Michelac and one of the props before the tournament started but I actually look at it these days and just see a team that's composed they've got real depth um, Gelebert who's come in is a good player. Um, the guy who's been playing for Dupont is a good. They just look strong, man. How do you think they'll fear this weekend? It'll just, geez, there'll be some contact there. <laughs> yeah, it's a biggie, all right. And I think, um, you know, I, I guess you look at the game and it's it's going to be tough for both teams, and it's going to come down to sort of small percentages or, or crucial moments during the during the match, and it's going to be the difference between potentially a. Uh, a win and a loss and, and playing in the semi-final. So it's a little bit unfortunate that you've got two big games in the semis and, totally. you know, with four big teams who are probably all got a chance of, of taking out the, the title, so to speak. But, yeah, it's World Cup rugby and you've got to turn up. So in, in terms of the French, I won't say they're confident, yeah. but you'd have to say that, you know, they're in a, in a pretty good position. Um and the, they've built a lot of confidence over the last four years or so with Fabian Gautier who stepped in. And they've created a, a really good um, team environment, a good core group of players who are playing some consistent rugby. Because mm. um, that's that thing, there's always that saying in the past and, and it's something we'll chat with you about when your time in the French team, but you never know what team French team's going to turn up. You sort of do these days, like a real good one. Like <laughs> that's yeah. kind of where they're at at the moment. They've yeah. got consistency and they're playing well. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And I think even if they're not playing well, they can still win. Yeah, you know they've showed that over the, the tournament. You know they had a, a couple of ad, average games, but they've still won. Yeah. So uh, and I think over the last couple of years they've shown that as well, and they've got confidence to back themselves. So I, I think they'll go into the game. Um, I won't say they'll be confident, but they'll give themselves a good shot at, at winning. That's for sure. 
Um, I think that the big thing for the Frenchies and all of the teams is that they don't let the pressure get to them, and especially the the home advantage or the home home thing. Um, if they don't let that get to them and they get up and they get the crowd behind them, that's going to be crucial for them. And that's like, you're fresh off this, and it's really something that's hard to put across for people and they've experienced themselves, but... The crowd thing's a big thing, isn't it? Like they, uh, the, a European crowd, a French crowd, a Parisian crowd makes about twenty times more noise than a Kiwi crowd. I promise you. Like it, it's a, it's a, it's an experience, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. <laughs> it, it's amazing. Until I went to France, I sort of didn't understand. Yeah. And like I remember back in the day, even back in the nineties, we had decent crowds, right? And yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty rowdy, but going up there is just next level. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's um, deafening when you when you're at the stadium, but yeah, it plays a massive part in the in the French psyche for yeah. sure. Mate, before we get into it, like we do with all our guests, a few warm up questions just to get to know you a little bit better, Marshy. So, um, mate, favourite player growing up and why? Mm, straight into it. Um, straight into it. Mate, uh, probably in the eighties. If you have a look at it, probably uh, I remember Buck. Yeah, just oh. just. Just because Buck was Buck, right? He yeah. had this, a lot of money about him. So, as a leader, so there's him. But in terms of centres, we're probably smoking Joe. Uh, how I, good was he? I, I think you know he's pretty fortunate. He played in a good all, Auckland team, good All Black team. But you know, sure he scored tries, but it was just everything about him. Was he, he did right? You know, his timing, his passing, and putting his outsides into space. So. Yeah, he was he was definitely one that I, I sort of looked out for. That's for sure. A couple of iconic, great All Black rugby players. What about for you, mate? Most influential person in your rugby career, coach, another player, father. You know, anyone sticks out for mine who really set you on the right course? Um, probably first off, probably the old man. Yeah, of course. <laughs> He's a bit of a bit of a taskmaster, master, so to speak. So. Um, I think uh, that old saying when you're only as good as your last game. So yeah, yeah, he put it kept me pretty grounded. <laughs> I, I think, but but outside of that, I probably you know I've had some some pretty good coaches over the years. But one guy that probably not a lot, a lot of guys think about, but my old county's coach Andrew Talamanu. Oh, so yeah. um, and why is basically because we did just a lot of lot of schoolwork. Just yeah. the, the basics, and it was week in, week out, and um, you know, luckily at counties we got to play in some, and a pretty good back line, and you know, yeah. the, 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 some pretty good stuff there. But yeah, without a doubt, Tully for sure. Love it. Um, best player you played with and against? Mm, that's a, that's a tough one as well. Pro- probably, if I'm going to say best player I played with is probably Jonah. Yeah, because I don't think we'll ever see another Jonah. And did part, you realise that at the time? You're like, what is this guy doing? Like, you know, well, he, he's pretty sensational. I think you know, 118 odd kilos of muscle. You run, and, he, and he could do anything. He could run through you, around you, you know, leave you gasping for air, sort of thing. So, there's him. He's pretty special. Um, and in saying that, rugby's changed, right? Yeah. Um, if he's playing today, he wouldn't have the spaces. Or the space that he had back then, so the the game has changed. But for sure, Jonah was just inc- incredible. The, the other guy on the the other wing, uh, Joe Alley, he was oh. pretty special as well. But it's one of my favourites growing up. He could make things happen, eh? Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> yeah, both of them were pretty lucky at counties to have both those guys on the wings. A few assists for Tony Marsh in those days. Holy <laughs> heck! Yeah. What about against, mate? Anyone that um, particular went to battle with and thought, geez, that was a tough day at the office? No, not not really. I, I think back in the day, you know, counties and playing um, provincial rugby, you got to play against a whole lot of players week in, week out, you know, and, and most of them were sort of all black yeah. quality or, or there or thereabouts. Um, and it was tough back in the day because mm-hmm. you're up against, you know, good quality players week in, week out. Um, if I'm going to single out a player, mate, to be honest, I don't know if I can. Really? And, you Play know, a Driscoll or any of those sort of guys yeah, up north, yeah, or yeah, I did, but um, you know, we, I played a Driscoll twice, but, but but both times we beat them convincingly. Yeah, and he didn't get a lot of space, and depending on your your defensive pattern, your running, or, or whatever, maybe you don't even get to tackle him. So yes. when you're dominant, you yeah. know, it, it's a little bit harder to say, but yeah, mate. 
if you didn't uh, find your way into to pro rugby, what have you been? Do- what would you've been doing through those years? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so, um, mate, back in the day in the nineties, I was actually in the police force. Believe it or not, oh, there we go. Yeah, and then um, obviously went to France, and then so re- resigned from that. Yeah. Um, today I'm in commercial property, so love that. Yeah. Yeah. And and have dabbled on that on a personal level. And back in your old stomping ground down in Pukeko or County's Way is where you're yeah. applying your trade if anyone needs a hand down there. Yeah, down in Puki, the old stomping ground, and and love it to be fair. Um, good people and good salt of the earth people down that way. Yeah. Um, and You'd have to tell a few war stories to get a few deals over the line, wouldn't you? Sometimes just to no, just mate, to make sure you get it signed on the dotted line. No, mate, they, they still pretty much do a deal on a handshake, just about. But, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Mate, you, you spent a long time in France. We're going to chat a little bit about that. But it is literally the home of style, sophistication, you know, food, wine, all of that sort of stuff. How's a, you know, a boy from counties, is that rubbed off on you? If we were to go around to your place for a dinner party, you know, what's on the menu? You know, food and wine, is it, is it all quality stuff? or? or? Mate, I'd like to say it has. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure because, um, yeah, growing up in South Auckland, I'm sure there's a store a bit of, <laughs> bit of that in me as well. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite funny because I ended up in a place called Clermont Fran, bang, bang smack in the middle of France, and it was a little bit backwards to be honest. Yeah. So I was I was in um, Michelin country with Michelin Tires, who are our main sponsors, and it was sort of known as an industrial town. Yeah. And not a place that you'd venture into normally speaking. Not a tourist destination as no, such. No. So it was a little bit backwards. But then when you say you you take off, you go to Paris or the yeah. the south of France and. And um, yeah, it's just next level. Even even going back recently, I just I forgot what it was all about. Just just the buzz, the fashion, the food, and and just the way you do things. But yeah, mate, I I, I love it all. Yeah. Um, I think um, when I was in France and even now in, in New Zealand, when people turn up at my home, they ask me one of two questions: is one. Am I gay? Or, or, or two, do I have a house cleaner? Because my house is so clean <laughs> and it's got a bit of class about it. Yeah, You are always well presented, mate. You're always tidy. I can imagine your place being tidy. But have you, have you got a go-to meal or a go-to red or, a go, or something that you picked up from your time mate, there? I was inspired over my, my stay um, in France. So just the week, just actually Saturday, just gone, I actually made beef tartare. Oh, there we are. There we go. And it, and it was good. It was very good. And a, <laughs> and a, and a bottle of Cote de Rhone. Yep. There we, that's so, what I was looking for. Beautiful. I knew it was something there. I knew there was something there. Mate, I want to talk a little bit about the early days. Was it all a traditional rugby journey for you in the early days, following the dad and the brother around and down to the local rugby club? Like, What sort of got you on that path to eventually being part of the county's team reasonably quickly? Yeah, it was, and remembering that back in the day it was rugby, and and rugby was that pretty much. Yeah, it's not like to, today in society. We live in a whole different society, but back in the day it was, for sure. Growing up with my brother, my twin brother Glenn, my older brother, and it was all about rugby. You know, rocking up on Saturday mornings, bare feet, um, and playing, and then watching the All Blacks getting up in the middle of the night sometimes when they're on the European tours. Um, and then with the with the old man down at the local rugby club and playing on the rugby field and and running around with everyone else, so yeah, it was no different from probably any other kid back in the day. And then, as you say, it was sort of just you know growing up um, rugby at high school. Didn't play first fifteen. Brilliant. Made a few of the counties teams, and then yeah, graduated to to senior rugby, and then on to county. So yeah, probably. Pretty classic, so to speak, yeah. Mate, give us some, some of your early memories of the county's team because as we were chatting to a little bit about before, like you remember the Jonas, you remember the Joe Alleys, like, and you remember some of those. You were some pretty um, it was sort of halcyon days for NPC and, and you know the various sides would all have you know, top players, all the All Blacks playing, etc. So some And there were some days when you knocked some big teams over. Was it... Did you get in there young? Did you get in there late? Were you always in the midfield? Like, was it was it was the team stacked, or was it just a few superstars in key places that you know created these X factor moments? Yeah, uh, I, I think. Well, first off, I was pro- probably pretty fortunate that I played in a in a decent counties team. Yeah, um, that's the first thing. And like you say, you know, we probably punched above our weight and beat some some pretty good teams. Um, and in saying that, we had some heavy defeats as well at times, but. I think if you think about that county's team, they're the likes of, and they're not not sort of household names, the likes of Andrew Roos, Lee Lidgard, yeah. 
Jim Jim Coe's there. Jim, Co. Jim, Jim Coe, Aura John, Errol Brain, Michael Scott, um, Dean Shepard. Yeah. Those sort of guys. And, 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 you know, yeah, sure, some of them played super rugby, but they were sort of what, what I'd classified as, and, and I'd put myself in there as well, was sort of, we're just sort of average sort of players. Just great NBC and, battlers. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I remember because we trained twice a week <laughs> and Mac McKay and the coach at the yeah, time, and, and he's got a, to be fair, he's got a, 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 a lot. A lot of credit to take as well for that, yeah. the, the way that we performed as well. But he said to us, listen, you've got two trainings a week. He said, um, we're probably not fit enough. You guys decide if you want to do a third training. Yeah. And it was just fitness. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we we just we train really hard and we played for each other. I, I think above anything else, it was, yeah, sure, we had some talent, but it was definitely about that. Good connection within the team. And, and maybe... Was it just having a couple of superstars gave a bit of belief, you know, if we can sort of um, provide the right platform and get some good ball to these fellas and, and perhaps those guys help, you know, like you say, lift the lift the true uh, grassroot NPC boys up um, and, and every, actually every now and again had a, had a couple of pretty good days at the office. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and uh, for sure, you know, you've got Jonah or Joely in the team, it always makes it a, li- a little bit easier. But, yeah, I think... Rugby hasn't changed as where it starts up front, right? Yeah. And so some of those those, those big uh, big boys had to perform first, so and they did quite often, you know. Any games stick out in the memory from like perhaps when you maybe knocked off one of the big boys or a shield game or or, or one of the games where maybe Jonah and Joe Ali had a. I mean, you played some good code yourself as well, mate. Like it was it was it was a good period. Yeah, it was. Um, one game comes to mind is probably the semi-final down in Hamilton against Waikato. We're yeah. down twenty odd points with about fifteen minutes to go, and we <laughs> we turned it around and managed to get a win. Um, so that that was a biggie. Um, no, I, I think just that whole era. Yeah, I think in terms of, I was pretty fortunate to play amateur and pro rugby, but some of my best days were in the amateur days. Yeah. Um, we all worked, sort of. We, we turned up, we trained hard, we played hard, and we had a bit of fun as well. Yeah. And sort of, sort of, I look back on it now, and it's um, with some very fond memories. And I actually wouldn't change a thing, mate. You obviously played well enough to to keep chipping away on sort of the the rugby pathway, I suppose, for lack of a better term. But like, in played for the Blues, and but then in in '98 made your way to the Crusaders and then you know as sort of saying to you before like we the Crusaders these days have won X amount of titles in a row and, and we sort of put them up as the bench park of a, a professional rugby club or franchise um, but in 96 they got flat last in 97 they probably did a little bit better and when you got there in 98 there wasn't that pedigree there yet and I want to ask you a couple of things um, around the environment then could you tell coming in you're a young guy but coming in then could you see that they're onto something maybe in the sense of you had some really you know well-known guys when it comes to Scott Robinson who's going to be the new all-black coach next year um you know Todd Blackadder one of the great sort of provincial leaders that we ever had you know Mertz was involved but also the professor you know and these days the professor's the prof- he's he's Yoda he's you know literally um the big dog in the coaching coaching world but back in 1998 you know was he putting across ideas that the that were perhaps a bit more left field, and and the boys were like, "What are you, what are you doing, Smithy?" Or did he have a way about him that he was able just to to make it stick straight away? Yeah, um, so I actually come into the environment a little bit late. I actually I was drafted down through injury. Yeah. Um, so arrived a little bit late down in camp, but straight away got the the feel that. Um, it was just everyone was the same. Everyone was treated um, equally. Even even as you say, there's a couple of stars down that way, a couple of All Blacks and that. But everyone was the same. I was made to feel welcome and and straight into it. And I think you know that obviously that year was the first year that the Crusaders won it. But you have to remember, I think the first two or three games we lost. Yeah, correct. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I talked to. To Smithy, we had a reunion a, well, a few years ago now, but he actually said that his head was on the chopping block. Wow, is that right? <laughs> and um, yeah, we needed, I forget who it was, we needed to beat someone at home um, and we, we just beat them and then... Sliding doors, there it is. And, and, and it was, and we got, we got a little, we're lucky enough to get a little bit of a roll on. Yeah. Um, 
and then was just win after win after win, and then it just obviously got, got into the top four. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, we, and we had to beat, I think it was the Sharks, we played last pool game away, we had to beat them to get a home semi, so we did. Um, and then played the Sharks again in the semi at home the following week, which we, we just got away with, and then... Um, up to the garden. Up to the garden, which, we've, again, we were pretty lucky to, to win that game. There's probably, you know, that second... I remember that second half were on our try line for about five minutes defending, and they got penalty after penalty, and yep. so... And a few things our way, so went our way, and we, we got a win, but, you know, again, it could have gone either way, but... I think, um, yeah, that that season there would have to be um, definitely one of the greatest moments of my rugby career as well. Just to sort of be a part of the journey and, and to go from, you know, a, a team that maybe wasn't expected to, to do well and get on. Because talk a little bit about Smithy. Did he, even then, did he have a, a way? You know, like people look, talk a lot about his EQ and his ability to connect with people, not just the, the detail and the preparation, which I think is that's just a given. But he seems to be able to assess a group and 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 find the best way forward for it. And he, like you say, has a little bit of luck, bounce of the ball stuff in the final. But but we're still the team still put itself in a position to be lucky, I suppose. Yeah, and and I remember back in the day with Smithy, he's pretty special sort of guys. He's yeah. a he's very relatable. Um, and I remember I was staying in the Cotswold Hotel, <laughs> which is a, a little studio at the local hotel but he just turned up randomly yep. you know some days and go hey Marsha you, you listen you need you're doing this well you need to work on this and he give me some work on to do and it was just those little things he showed confidence in you yep. to to do the job for him and and you wanted to sort of return the favor I guess and what about Razor mate like he's going to be your black coach next year and and he's always done things a little bit differently to do them a bit differently as a player as well like he's he was a talented player like seven eight and you know extremely mobile a guy who like yourself ended up spending a lot of time in France how did he operate oh mate Razor's Razor he's, yeah. he's a little bit different he's got this this big energy about him right yep. where he's just a little bit left left field and and doing his Razor thing right and and he's pretty unique and mate I, I, I love being around Razor because you, you just can't sort of help but sort of pick up on his energy and his vibe and his positivity and, and all the rest of it that goes with it. So, yeah, mate, he, he hasn't changed. If, if anything, when I catch up with him, he's all sort of talking about, you know, he's doing this, he's doing that. He's got different ways of looking at things and is really motivational and really good to be around. Mate, awesome. Now... You, you you've touched on a little bit already. You ended up in in Clermont, like actually went quite young um, compared to others. Like, what got you there? Did, you know, was there a French connection, or, or like, how did they lure you, lure you to you know the middle of France when you were sort of mid twenties? So I went the end of for well, the back end of nineteen ninety eight. So, and there's a couple of reasons why. I think back in the day. Um, you have to remember the contract sort of situation was different with yeah. the with the NZRFU. So, if you sign, and I'll give you an example, if you signed a three year contract, if after year one you were injured or they didn't select you, that you'd stop getting paid. Uh, okay. So it was very much like that. There wasn't a lot of security. It was 1998. It was World Cup year the following year. Only two years into professionalism, wasn't it? Into professionalism. So yeah, it was early days. Yeah, and um, you know it wasn't back in the in the day. No one went in their sort of mid twenties. Everyone nah. went at the end of their careers to you know have a bit of a have a bit of fun, I guess. Yep. Um, but I decided no, I was, was going to make the move and go up north, and it wasn't an easy decision to be fair. Um, and part of that part of that reasoning was that I didn't think I was going to make that next step. Right. Um, Ninety eight is little bunts who were the incumbents yeah, yeah, but yeah. then you had a whole backlog of centres you know yeah. there's the likes of Norm Berryman Stensness uh, Ronnie Clark yes, Aramia yeah. Mark John Mayer, Lesley, Hoffler, yeah, Tabby Matson, Matson yeah. Matt, John John Leslie yeah. Mark, uh, Ellis. Mark Ellis yeah, yeah it, was, it was like that and yeah. it was just like okay I'm probably not good enough so why don't I go now yeah and so I did I maybe I, thought you'd could maybe come back. That was maybe or, or not no, sure. No, <laughs> no, no. I was I was gone, and that was it. Yeah, it was always the case. Um, but in saying that, funny enough, after year one in France, I sort of was missing home. I was, it was a, a little bit different back then. Um, I sort of missed the challenge. 
Yeah. Because you're over there, you're sort of, it's a long season, you're with the same team 10 months of the year. Um, at the time, the rugby wasn't as good, and I just, I needed to be challenged. Yeah. And so I did actually look at coming back, oh. but for one reason or another, it just never happened. Mate, so tell us about it. You get over there, um, you've decided to, to give something else a go, like, and good on you, but, you know, do you speak French? Like, as what's Clement like, you know, like... Um, do they bring you in like I was always hear, particularly from now that we're talking 20 years ago, that, you know, the French would train in a 4 by 4 square and just go at it or, you know, like the um, sit in the change room before a match and have three espressos and bang your head against the other prop and, and out you go and play. You know, was was that what it was like or, or was it Mate, actually... It was actually a whole other world. <laughs> and, and, and to be fair, probably one of the hardest years of my life yeah. So remember, you turn up with two bags. You're in a foreign ta- town. You can't speak the language. You know no one. <laughs> um, and I, w- I was lost. And to be yeah. honest, it was really difficult. I can imagine. Um, I, in saying that, I was probably fortunate that with being at, um, a Michelin country, that they all had to to do was worry about was playing rugby, yeah. and everything else was looked after. Because that so, was the town, eh? Like it was Clermont was basically a, a industrial town backing the this massive company, Michelin, which makes the tyres, and rugby was what, what they did on the weekends almost. That was My, their town. 100%. And they <laughs> run the town, and they have whatever they say goes. Yeah. And so, and, and like, like you have to forget, you know, you're in the middle of France in the small town, and, and rugby's it. Yeah. Rugby is it. So basically everyone lives for the rugby. So you'll get guys, they'll buy their season tickets and all this, they don't earn a lot of money, but all their spend money goes on rugby and they follow the team around the whole of France, the whole of Europe, and, and wow. they they live for it. Awesome. And, and and so that that's pretty cool. Um, but in terms of, like, when I went there, there's very little foreigners. There's probably two per team yeah. at best. Um, so you're very much in the thick of it. Um, everything was in French. And so coming from... Probably what well, was professional here, um, and you're going into what was very much the like amateur environment. Yeah. Um, and for me, you know, things were well. It took a while to get my head around things, but as soon as I accepted that, you know, you're in France, you embrace know, it, embrace it, just get on with it. And um, as soon as I did that, it was great. Uh, and don't get me wrong, like I said, there's some some hard times with it, but. Um, Probably in some respects it made me into a better rugby player because um, it was just play what's in front of you. And, yeah. and you talk about French flair, um, yeah, yeah, they've got it. It's probably a little bit different and rugby's a lot more structured now. But back in, back in the day, like rugby training on a Wednesday night, was A team against the B team, <laughs> throw the ball up in the air, catch, and just play rugby. Yeah, just go for it. And just play rugby. So you had props and locks running around doing, you know, dummy passes and all the rest of it. And uh, to be fair, some of those Wednesday night sessions were harder than the game on the Saturday because <laughs> they're just beating the shit out of each other. Oh, mate, and doing that for 10 months of the year, like every yeah. week, and then playing a big game on Saturday. And, and I, I assume the expectation is that if you're fit and firing, you're out there and you're playing every weekend. Yep, mate, the, the club's paying you, and so they want their money's worth. And yeah. so, yeah, there's loads of game where it's like you don't have a choice, you're playing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and even to the um, extent where, um, and I'll jump forward a little bit, 203 World Cup, we were struggling a little bit through injury, and my club was ringing me and said, we, we don't want you to play for France. You're, yeah, you right. know, you've got a whole season to play when you get back home to France. Stay fit. Yeah, wow. we don't want you injured. Mate, we'll talk of that, but I mean, what was the first French words you learned? You know, one, two, cut, two up, just so that you could, you know, get your hands on the ball and get in the mix. And because and, it, we're sort of joking about it, but like going into a competitive game of footy against um, Toulouse or Toulon or, you know, one of the Paris teams, like, and not really knowing the calls or the shape or, or having a way to communicate with uh, the 10 or, or the 9 or, or anyone well, for that matter, that's that's pretty intimidating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, but you just get on with it. And, yeah. and to be fair, there wasn't a lot of shape back then when, yep. I, when I went there. It was just play and play what's in front of you. And that, that's why, why I said it probably made me into a better yep. player in some respects. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, there wasn't a lot of shape. Um, you basically had your move caught after first phase, and that was it. Yeah. So I, to be fair, I, I don't str- mind that. <laughs> yeah, I struggled a little bit with it. Um, I I do remember my first game I played. So um, I played for the second team. So we played Perigo, which was about a four-hour bus trip away. So played that, had dinner on the or lunch on the way, played the game. It was twelve all. Um, penalty kicks only in the game yeah. it went to first phase and then that was it so reset the scrum and that was the whole game and then got in the bus and had a four hour bus trip back home so yeah that was my intro to French rugby welcome yeah. to French footy yeah oh, wow but what's what was sort of the circuit breaker in the end like you say that first year was tough but was it um, because you embraced it, it was because you started playing well it's because you learned a little bit of the language like what, what was sort of because um, you ended up being there eight years or something so obviously found your feet and, and then some yeah I, I think I went through sort of a period there where I sort of transitioned into pro rugby so um, we got a couple of foreign coaches in there they're more foreigners that come in after the 99 World Cup um, the competition changed somewhat as well they went from something like 24 teams down to uh, 16 yeah so it changed for example so initially the first year or two you're playing one week you're winning by 70 points and the oh, final yeah. week you're losing by 20. yeah so just in, in terms of the quality of rugby and training it got a lot of uh, a lot better and professionalism like with the stadiums the money and all the rest of it it just got bigger and bigger and you have to remember that uh f- football's yeah, Num- number one over there, and, and miles ahead. Even today, it's miles yeah. ahead. Well, they go um, pretty good. So yeah, yeah, and so, um, but yeah, sort of rugby when I was there, sort of early sort of two thousands, it sort of took off, um, and just a lot of that was sort of to do with just the the rugby values around it, and it was just so different from football that it attracted a whole lot of different people to it as well more community so like that, that that connection part was that what it was rather than sort of the um you know at times if i'm critical of football that's it is all about the money sometimes it was yeah and i, and I think also the public had access to the players as well yeah um and, and and like again and we touched on it but sort of they're, they're very fanatical over there. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, like, sometimes it's sort of over the top and it can be overpowering at times. But, yeah, they're fanatical and they'll be – it'll be zero degrees in the after training they'll still there two hours waiting for you wow. sort of thing. Amazing. Yeah. Mate, now, sort of eventually you came through and, and you made the French side. Now, what created that? Was it um, – you obviously were playing well. Were, were Clermont – Going well, making finals, making European, like what sort of put you um, on their radar um, to be firstly um, an opportunity to play for them and then even to even know if, if you qualify and, and whether you can because it was a little bit trailblazery as we sort of said there were Kiwis who had played for maybe tier two, tier three sort of teams around the world and, and these days a number of tier one teams have um, players who are born in another country but you, you were out the gate pretty early with it. How did it all come about? Yeah, well, so obviously I qualified through my three years of residency and having never played for the ABs, although I did play a game for um, New Zealand A and Samoa, which actually didn't qualify me. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was probably quite fortunate in, in that sense. So um, there, there's a little bit of talk around it from from the journalists and that, but I didn't think much of it. And then they named the French team that was 201 for the autumn series, which is November series. I wasn't named in it. And then basically I was, I remember it, I was on a Tuesday night sitting in a restaurant and I got a phone call from the then manager, Joe Mazzo, who said, you know, we've got an injury, we want you to come up, you're playing South Africa Saturday. And I, I thought, actually thought it was one of my mates pulling my leg, so I hung up. <laughs> 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 and, and he rung back and then he put me on to Bernard Laporte, who was a, who was okay. a coach at the time, and he comes from um, south of France and uh, speaks very quickly with a strong accent and I didn't understand a word he said. So basically just said we we and then um yeah next morning and i, was I might up, be in the french team maybe not sure yeah <laughs> ne- the next morning i was playing up to paris and and so it all happened pretty quickly and um to to be fair there was 
Um, they call it a polemic in French, but there was a lot of talk about whether I should be playing for France, being a being a being a foreigner. I was going to ask that because the French are very French, you know. Like I'm sure they want French people rep- representing their national sides and and that sort of thing. So I was going to ask, was there any controversy around you putting on the the blue jersey? Yeah, I don't know if it was controversy, but there's definitely talk about it. Is that I was taking the place of a of a French player, which yeah. uh, which I understand 100. percent So. In that respect, I probably always felt like I had to sort of prove myself that little yep. bit more or do that little bit more um, to sort of, to, one, earn the respect, to, to, but to prove to everyone that I should be there. I mean, and it was always in the back of the mind, my mind, but it was I probably have it no other way anyway. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And let's, like, I think perhaps at times the world's got a lot smaller these days and we see a lot of the, the teams that the All Blacks are playing against. We just see a lot more sport on TV. We just see a lot more analysis through social and just there's a lot more, it's a lot easier to consume information and scout and find out about teams. But back then, I don't know if Kiwis really realised that through that period, England and France were pretty strong. You know, like that, that was, they were pretty strong, pretty strong teams. And, and to the point you made before, like fans travelled, you know, the, the stadiums, well, pump. There's a lot of history when it comes to the Six Nations. There's a lot of history around winning Grand Slams and doing things like that. Like, was it? Um, what was it like to get into that environment? Because there's some pretty well-known guys there. And we, I think, the French coach Fabien Gaultier, He was probably in the team at the time, sort of, you know, running those lovely John Coo and glasses these days. Very stylish individual. But like, th- there was some Fabien Palouse. There's some really um, good players and well-known players in, in that part of the world. Was it? Um, was it a pretty intimidating environment? Because it's a bit different from, like you say, yep, County's got some some good crowds in, like 100%, and I'm sure uh, we, Clermont went to a, a, a final, a semis, a final European Cup. Um, it was intense, but, you know, Le Crunch, England versus France is is a big deal, and, and um, you know, you might skip your Monday morning coffee at 9 o'clock down at the local cafe if you if you don't get the W on picking. That's, that's my assumption anyway. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about intimidating. I think you go into that sort of team, and and again, I was fortunate to play in a pretty consistent and and a good French team at the time. Like I think my first eight games we had, we had eight wins, so one, yeah, you know, the autumn series, and then when one in two thousand and two won the Grand Slam, yeah, which is, and that's a big deal. Like that, that's not something that's often done, and and at the time, England in particular were strong. You know, a year later they won the World Cup, so it was a good side. Yeah, it was a good side, and and to to, to be fair, um, yeah, we we played some pretty good rugby, and we we're fortunate to have some good players. Like you say, you touched on Fabien Pelouse, Rafa Ibanez, who's a French manager, Fabien yep. Galte, the French coach, Olivier Mann, Serge Betson. Serge Betson, geez, he could play. Yeah, you know, Michelac was there, um, Rougerie was there. Yeah, um, so so we're pretty lucky, but we we played some good rugby. Yeah. And just as you say, to play in the Six Nations and and win the Grand Slam is something pretty spe- special. And, and like a lot of players don't get to do it. Yeah, you can win the Six Nations, but a Grand Slam is something else. Yeah. Um, and that was was pretty cool. Um, and in terms of just that whole experience of a Six Nation and Nations and what goes with it, so travelling away and some of those away games I look back real real fondly like some of the national anthem, anthems in Wales and Scotland were you know sort of goosebump stuff um, but like you say beat um, England who are pretty a uh, very very good English side and we beat them at home so and let's talk a little bit about that like in terms of because it doesn't really matter what the form of the teams are when when France play England it's all on like I mean some of the the games you see highlights of in the 80s and 90s are basically just a WWF fight. Like, it's just absolute brutality. It's ridiculous. Um, and that sort of carried through to um, when you were playing. But as you said, you know, England, it was Wilkinson, it was Johnson, it was, um, you know, the team that went through, Ben Cohen, etc. cetera, and uh, Matt Dawson won the World Cup, you know. So was that perhaps one of your favourite games in the jersey and what's the build-up like for something like that? Do they Is that when we're banging heads in the in the, in the the corridor and starting to get a little bit loose? No, I, th- I think it was... Like, well, I remember Paris, um, it was raining that day, but I guess playing the, the English, there's something about it. 
Yeah. And there's always an edge on the game, and the French are always <laughs> up for it. And, and it goes back. It goes back. There's a lot of history between the two countries, and it goes back years. But the French will always get up against the English, without a doubt. And I think it was. It was funny because I remember we played the first half and we were up, I don't know how much we were up by, but it was like we just turned up and, and did our um, our team run, yep. our team training, because everything happened on the field as it did in training. Try. So so it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, but but adding to that, like I say, like the French always get up for it and there's some games um, that I played with that French team and you could never lose. Yeah, you, you were never going to lose. Because they, they were so up for it. They were so up for it. And, yeah, they just backed themselves 100%. And it's like that thing when the French get their back up, yep. there's no stopping them. And yep. that was one of those games. Awesome. Mate, sort of was it the end of 202 or around 203, you had a cancer diagnosis. Like, um, that's that's a heck of a thing for a, for a young professional athlete to get thrown in there, sort of by definition probably as as fit as you can be, you know, and with um, a whole lot of stuff wrapped around you around um, high performance strength and conditioning and, and you get told you've got a, a cancer diagnosis. Do you want to just tell us a little bit around just how you found that out first? Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was actually, in, well, I was in, I'd had a uh, hernia so in November, so I'd, I'd been operated on and funnily enough, um, my doctor at the time said, oh, you've got a little issue with one of your testicles. You should get it checked out. And I thought nothing nothing about it. But then two months later, I'm training, fit, ready, sort of a week or two away from playing. And then we had a, a, a blood test, just a regular checkup. And yep. it, basically I had some some abnormalities with my hormone levels. So, so I got called into the doctor's office and said, listen, you need to do it another blood test will have to wait two weeks but you can't play so two weeks later same thing happens again my my bloods aren't abnormal so this time I'm called into the manager's office who is like um, and questioning me whether or not I'm taking um, drugs because of my hormone normally speaking it's it would have, drugs have changed my hormone levels so yeah yeah so and obviously I'm not so he said well We've got to wait another two weeks. Um, you still can't play, um, and so I'm training. I'm by this stage probably getting a little bit stressed about things and what's happening. So um, third blood test, same thing, I'm, and I'm caught up into the president's office this time <laughs> with, with the manager, and just about accused of taking drugs again. Um, and so they send me to a specialist who gives me a 40-minute speech around the consequences of taking drugs and then examines oh, me. Jesus, went, oh, you're no. being accused. Yeah, you, listen, you better go see another specialist. So, um, and so, Actually, I remember it was a Friday night so, and about 6 or 7 o'clock on a Friday night, and in some respects I was a little bit relieved that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't being, no longer being accused of taking drugs. And yeah. I had, had, had another, well, something else I had to sort out. So, yeah. Um, I, I was lucky. I, you know, they really looked after me yeah. in terms of. They actually you know, got amazing treatment in France, don't they? I've been they, told it's out the gate. And they do, and I got really, really well looked after. So Paris had an operation, and then I, I had to go through a short stint of, of chemo in Lyon, and they sent me to the best guy in France, basically. Yeah. Got my treatment, and then six months later, I was playing at the World Cup Mate, in Australia. Okay. And I suppose. Like you say, you you got it nice and early, which was great. You had a good outcome, and, and and actually, I suppose you always had that carrot of trying to get to World Cup, which I imagine had been a goal. But actually, within that two thousand and three Rugby World Cup, which you got to, um, you got to play against the All Blacks. Is is that was that a goal, or is that you know like was obviously for a lot of the matches, you're not necessarily going to come across the All Blacks. It's only um, at, at different times. But did you think? that's something I'd love to do is, is sort of face the hucker and play against the black jersey and, and even probably I'm sure a number of the guys you knew from, from when you were playing in New Zealand either with or against you know like kind of what was that like? Well to be fair actually it was probably the, the only question when I got selected for France that I asked myself is like if it comes a time when I play the ABs what's that going to be like? Yeah. And can because hey I'm still a Kiwi at heart right? Totally. But can I can I, you know, give play a hundred percent or give my all playing against ABs? And the question was always, always, well, the answer was always yes, right? Yeah. Because 
when I when I well, I'd like to to say that whenever I got on the rugby field, I gave a hundred percent always, right? Yeah. Um. So that that first game you're talking about in two oh three, so was for the third third place. So yes. we both lost our semis. So to be fair, neither neither of the teams <laughs> wanted to be there. And the, yeah. You know, you got a World Cup to win it, not totally. to play for third. So we we didn't want to be there. So. Um, and but you have to turn up and play the game, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but probably my last game in two oh four was against All Blacks in Paris. Yeah. Um, and it was it was something else. It was pretty special. I, and I and I think sort of I, I think back sort of a couple of years earlier uh, we were training at um, Clairefontaine, which is where the French team trained out near, near the uh, French football. Um, Centre, but I remember sitting around with a, with a few of the boys having a coffee. There's Serge Betson, Olivia Mann, and a few of the guys, and and Charlie Mann said to me, "Oh, just playing the ABs is something different." And I went, "Oh, what do you mean?" He goes, "Oh, there's just something about they've got an aura about them. There's um the haka. It's just something special." And I and I sort of didn't get it, but I, but I got it on that my yeah. last test for France. I got it. Yeah. Um, in terms of. And I remember I was pretty emotional singing the national anthems and, and really proud to be playing for, for, for France. It was just like, how good is this? Yeah. And like you say, there's a lot of guys in that coaching environment or, or the players who I'd have played against in New Zealand. So it's pretty special. But fronting up to that haka and, and Tana led it that day, Oof. there's just this, this yeah. energy around it. And it's just like, even for a Kiwi, I was just like, whoa, this is, cool. this is pretty powerful. And there is a... Um you know, you, you hear it speaking about it a lot, but there's there's a relationship there. There's a respect there, isn't there, between like the French, they love the All Blacks, don't? Or they love they love the contest. They love the relationship. There's a huge amount of respect there um, between the two nations for some reason. Perhaps of some of the the epic games that have that have been played over the years. And and um, you know, I was in uh, the quarter final when France beat New Zealand 2007, and and um, the French fans were were stoked, obviously, absolutely stoked, and I was, I was pretty much in tears. But they were so respectful, and they were so happy, and they were almost apologetic, and and just you could tell that there was no animosity there. Like there was, they was, yeah. I mean, it was they were frustratingly nice to us. <laughs> about no, and, it. and there is they, <laughs> the, the French love the ABs. Yeah, if you know, if there's any other team that they're going to support, it's going to be New Zealand. Yeah, just because it's it's New Zealand, and in the history of of New Zealand rugby, obviously. And probably more than anything, you know, there's a, there's a history, but it's probably the the way that the New All Blacks have played over the years, which they love. Yep, awesome. Just a style of rugby and and doing things, I, I guess, the Kiwi way. So, yeah. I want to finish on, um, because there's been some fantastic French sides over the years, like 100%, and th- those whole things around what sort of French side's going to turn up, as we chatted a little bit about at the start, like that, that sort of changed. Why has it changed? Like in the sense that they are just a for quite a wee while now, just a consistently very good side. They have depth, they have really good players. Yep, they still have, to you spoke about, some French flair, but there's there's clearly some structure there. There's real prof- professionalism there. Like um, the, the top fat at 14's a great comp and there, there's a lot of Kiwis in there and there's Irish and there's it's almost become, you know, a, a really global um, a domestic competition. Like, what are they getting right, you know, that, that has seen them um, develop a real consistency about their rugby? I, th- I think the first thing they've got right is the focus is on the French national team. Right. Where when I was there, it was very much focus around the club because the club were paying the players, so they wanted their money's worth. Yeah. And so in some respects, the French team was secondary. Wow. And I, I know for a lot of potentially players and clubs and coaches, managers, the French national team was secondary. Wow. Yeah, and so they've they've turned that around for sure. The other thing is that they focus more on their their local fr- uh, French players, so they've changed the rules and and, and um, they call it GIF. So it's their um, academy players. So you've got oh, to have so many players that come through your academy system. Okay. Yeah. To be eligible to 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 play for the your club team, but then obviously it's going to um, filter on through to the national team. And then thirdly, um, in 2016, the French acknowledged that, you know, they were struggling yeah. with some of the, 
the way that they, especially around their coaching and the way they did things with their, their younger age group teams, um, their national coaches throughout the country. So they put in a whole new program in 2016 and it was led by, and I hopefully I don't get this, led by an ex-French player, I think it was Ville who who was there and, and changed the way that they did things. So... Um, and, and you've seen it sort of filter on into their under twenties team, yeah. where a lot of this French team today has has come up through their age group rugby and through the twenties, under twenties, where they won a couple of World Cups and were very successful there. And you'll see it like this year, earlier this year, they won the under twenties again, right? Yeah, smoked it, won the final by forty points. Yeah, yeah. So they're getting something right, and but it's it's again I, I, they acknowledge they weren't where they should be and they, so they changed things yeah mate awesome thank you so much for coming in mate it's really good insight particularly you know at the moment with a, a world cup in france and and um you know potentially a, a french team doing really really well so i appreciate it brother good luck uh, back in pookie hopefully you uh get the selection out of the way this weekend and can shift a bit of property but i really appreciate you coming in and giving us a bit of insight to your career and also the tournament that's going on at the moment cheers man appreciate it thanks and it's been a pleasure cheers The All Blacks podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black be the best run in sports. Hosted by Rob Dunn in the Hargrave Street Studio. Produced by Carl Thompson from Blue and Ginge, the podcast producers. Video editing by Mac Leesberg, graphics by Western Design, content advising from Andy Burt, and commercial manager for the podcast is Valeska Hoth. Follow the All Blacks podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and anywhere you get your podcasts.